Hello everybody again and welcome to the eighth recap webinar. Today's webinar is entitled Rethinking Capitalism After COVID, The Power of Creative Destruction. Our speaker is Professor Philippe Aguillon. Philippe is Professor of Economics at the Collège de France in Seattle and the London School of Economics and Political Science. He's a fellow of the Economic Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's also an RCA honorary fellow. His research focuses on the economics of growth. With Peter Howitt, he pioneered the so-called Schumpeterian growth paradigm, which was subsequently used to analyze the design of growth policies and the state's role in the growth process. Much of this work, originally published in top scientific journals, such as Econometrica, American Economic Review, Journal of Political Economy, is summarized in their joint books, Endogenous Growth Theory and the Economics of Growth. In his book with Rachel Griffith on competition and growth, in the survey paper, What Do We Learn from Schumpeterian Growth? And his most recent book, The Power of Creative Destruction. In 2001, Philippe received the Irio Johnson Award. In 2009, the John von Neumann Award. And in 2016, the Global Entrepreneurship Award. Today, Philippe, will tell us about the process of creative destruction and how this concept provides a framework to understand the inner dynamics at work in our capitalist societies and the current transition towards a post-COVID context. The concept of creative destruction is grounded on an evolutionary dialectic vision. Economic attractor turns into its opposite, into an economic repeller pushing the system into a new yet only temporary state. And the driving force of this process, it's a lambital, is humanity's natural creative impetus. In this respect, the recent crisis has clearly shown the serious problems plaguing our economic, social, and political systems. It has shown, for instance, the dysfunctional social welfare and healthcare systems in the US and the mounting social distress against a structurally unequal and unfair allocation of income and wealth. The crisis has also shown the inadequate innovation system in Europe and the missed opportunity for growth that originated from a divided Europe. It has shown the lack of transparency and the excess concentration of power in China and Russia. The crisis has finally shown the potential implication of a failed transition to a more sustainable production model worldwide. But the crisis is also an opportunity for change. In capitalism, to empower the process of creative destruction while softening its impact on happiness, to direct creative destruction towards greener and more equitable growth, to avoid excessive concentration of wealth and power threatening our democracies and the process of economic growth itself. Without further ado, Philippe, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So thanks so much for inviting me. Uh, let me share screen. Voilà. Great. So, uh, so my, my title of my talk is Rethinking Capitalism, the Power of Creative Destruction. Uh, thank you so much, Claudio, for your introduction. Uh, if I, you have a problem hearing me, let me know. Um, this is uh, based on my recent book, The Power of Creative Destruction, joined with Céline Antonin, who is a researcher at Sciences Po Paris and uh, Collège de France, and Simon Bunel, who is a researcher at Banque de France and Collège de France with me. So here is a picture, a photo picture of Schumpeter, young age. <coughs> so creative destruction is this term coined by Schumpeter to refer to the fact that new innovations displace old technologies. It is the process whereby new innovations make old technologies become obsolete. Uh, and for example, Schumpeter has, you know, described this in various, you know, writings like Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, and in other books. Uh, but when I when I studied growth economics, uh, there was no such thing as a Schumpeterian growth model. It didn't exist. Uh, I would we would study uh, Solo, Ramsey. Uh, that's what that, that those were the growth models we would analyze. Uh, but nothing, and Schumpeter would be a curiosity, you know, in a, a course on history of economic thought or, or uh, a course on industrial organization. So 
sometimes, occasionally, we, we, one would mention Schumpeter and say, ah, you know, Schumpeter, and he has this idea of innovation is important for growth and, uh, and prosperity, and, and that there is, you know, uh, creative destruction. But there was no such thing as a, a Schumpeterian growth model. That we built with Peter Howitt in 1997, we built a new growth model, uh, uh, which we now refer to as a Schumpeterian growth paradigm, uh, and which uh, revolves around three main ideas. The, third idea, the first idea is that long-run growth is driven by a cumulative process of innovation, where each innovator builds upon previous innovators. The second uh, uh, idea is that innovations result from entrepreneurial activities, particularly R&D investment, another type of investment, motivated by the prospect of innovation rents. When you innovate, at least for a while, you become a monopoly or a local monopoly until you are being imitated or superseded by a, a, a better product or better way of doing things. But at least for a while, you get monopoly rents uh, from innovating. And it's the prospect of these rents that motivates the uh, process of innovation. And the third idea is creative destruction. New innovations displace old technology they make all technologies become obsolete. And you can see right away that at the heart of the growth process, there is a contradiction. On the one hand, you need uh, these monopoly rents to, to motivate innovation activities. But on the other hand, those rents will, can be used ex post to prevent subsequent innovation and block subsequent entry. Because yesterday's innovator doesn't want herself to be you know, replaced uh, by a subsequent innovator, doesn't want herself to be subject to creative destruction. I like to do creative destruction to my predecessor, but I don't want myself to be victim of creative destruction. And regulating capitalism is all about managing this contradiction. How can I at the same time provide incentives for innovation and make sure that the innovator will not use these rents, their rents for innovation to prevent subsequent innovation? And in fact, the, the, this contradiction is at the heart of the whole book. Whether you talk about the, the industry, the growth takeoff, whether you talk about the middle income trap, whether you talk about the secular stagnation, whether you talk about you know, uh, the relationship between innovation and inequality, you always come across this contradiction. On the one hand, you know, innovations rely on monopoly rents, but on the other hand, there is a temptation to use these rents to prevent subsequent innovation. And Schumpeter himself was deeply pessimistic about the future of capitalism because he thought that the first innovators would turn into entrenched incumbents, entrenched conglomerates that would successfully prevent subsequent innovations. And in fact, in this book, we say, well, maybe Schumpeter was too pessimistic. There are, in fact, you know, uh, uh, re there, there are instruments that you can use or there are forces that can be mobilized to avert the pessimistic prediction that Schumpeter had about the future of capitalism. And I will, we try here to identify why those forces can be. And so instead of being pessimistic like Schumpeter, we are, like I would say, Gramscian uh, 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 optimist. That means it's not an optimism of something I believe that things will come all you know, cooked uh, for free. Uh, we, we have to fight for things to happen, but there are these forces that can be mobilized for the pessimistic prediction of Schumpeter to, uh, to not be, to, to not materialize. So, so that's, uh, to, uh, to counter these uh, forces, you know, that block new entry and block new innovation. Okay, so what we do in this book is to, uh, is to, do, uh, to use the lens of creative destruction and of the paradigm that I just outlaid, this paradigm, mm -hmm, to do three main things. One, the first thing is to revisit some main enigmas of growth history. The second thing is to question some common wisdom. The third one is to rethink the future of capitalism. But before I do that, let me just tell you that, uh, 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 you know, uh, creative destruction is not just an abstract concept. It's something now we can measure. One measure of creative destruction is the flow of patents. Here, it's a, it's a regression, which is drawn from recent work by uh, Ufu Kaksigit, uh, John Grigsby, and, and Tom Nicholas, where they look at the relationship between patent flow and productivity growth. And it, it, that's across US state uh, regression. Uh, averaged uh, over the whole uh, 20th century. And they showed that uh, uh, those states which on average show uh, hi the highest uh, yearly flow of patents, the more to the right, are also those states which display 
you know, the highest uh, 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 per capita GDP growth rate on average, annual average over the, the 20th century. And in fact, they show that it's a causal relationship uh, from flow of patents to productivity growth. So one measure of creative destruction is the flow of new patents, okay? Another measure is the creation and destruction of jobs or the creation and destruction of firms, what we call firm churning. And again, one can show that in the regions or, or countries where you have more uh, job turnover or firm turnover, firm churning, you have also higher productivity growth rates, okay? So that's another. And you know, you have things about the life cycle. When you are in the world of creative destruction, you look on the left-hand side at the, uh, you know, at the growth of a firm. So when a firm is very young, it's, it, uh, its size grows. You can measure the growth, the size of the firm by employment. And usually there is a positive rate of employment, of, uh, 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 a positive growth rate of employment. And as the firm matures, uh, you move to the right, this growth rate goes to zero. That means that after you know, 10, 15 years, uh, the size of the firm stabilizes, okay? So that's, uh, that's one thing about firms. Another thing is about the rate of exit. Young firms tend to exit more than old firms. And you can talk about firm dynamics. So the paradigm of creative destruction is a paradigm that talks about uh, incumbents, entrants, uh, big firms, small firms, uh, the birth of firms, the growth of firms, the exit of firms. It's all about firm dynamics. That's what it's all about. And the econometrics that goes with uh, the Schumpeterian uh, paradigm is a microeconometrics. It's, it's done on, on plant level data, firm level data. And it's all about, uh, and we very much with heterogeneity. You have the incumbents, the entrants, the big firms, the small firms, firm dynamics. It's all about that. Okay. And it's very different from the econometrics that was a pure cost country econometrics of growth uh, pre uh, Schumpeterian paradigm. Okay. So now, as I said, we do three main things with this, with this paradigm. First is to revisit some historical enigma. Uh, 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 and uh, the enigma I want to just mention here, but there are more enigma in the book, in the uh, power of creative destruction. The first enigma is industrial takeoff. So in fact, we know in particular from the work of Madison that uh, growth is a recent phenomenon. Essentially, there might have been episodes of growth, for example, Venice, went through a growth period, you know, in the 15th, 16th century, uh, you know, the, 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 of other, you know, even before, but, but other places, but the growth was never long lasting. The true takeoff of growth is uh, the early 19th century. And it comes with the first industrial revolution and first happened in England and then uh, in France and then US. And uh, you see how various countries take off. The first one to take off is the UK then followed by France, and so China, of course, takes up much more recently, you have here China. But what's interesting is why is it that the takeoff <clears throat> took place in France, in Europe, sorry, in 1820, and not long before, for example, China was a country which uh, went through many inventions, the wheel, the compass, many things have been invented in China long before uh, the 19th century. So why so, uh, so recently? and why in Europe. And that's uh, what we try to analyze in chapter two of the book. And that's the work of Joel Mokir. <clears throat> but Joel Mokir, what's very interesting with Joel Mokir is that the explanation he gives can be really uh, reinterpreted in, in light of the Schumpeterian growth paradigm. First, Joel Mokir tells you that you have the institutions that would favor cumulative innovation in Europe, in particular universities, the Republic of Science, uh, the Encyclopedia, in uh, uh, England and France, uh, which codify knowledge and make it much easier for new potential innovators to build upon previous innovation. So all those things that would make the first bullet point possible existed in Europe more than elsewhere. <clears throat> the second condition is that you needed to protect property rights on innovation to make sure that an innovator could really capture the benefit from her innovation. And for that, you needed property right protection. In England, the Glorious Revolution, uh, in France, the French Revolution followed by Napoleon, uh, led to uh, uh, you know, much better property right protection on entrepreneurs' uh, 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 innovation. Okay, so that, that's why it's it was in Europe and not elsewhere. First. And the third one is creative destruction. New innovation displaces all technology. So, of course, uh, uh, incumbent innovators will try to prevent future innovation. But it goes further than that. 
in China, uh, emperors would always, you know, would feel threatened by innovation and they would try to prevent new innovation. But in Europe, uh, and again, Mokir tells you that the competition between European countries would, uh, would, would be such that if a scientist is persecuted in France, for example, he could, he or she could flee to Switzerland or to England or to Prussia and continue her research activities there and, uh, and, and, and innovate there. And that innovation would compete with France, you see. So that would discourage France maybe from, uh, you know, persecuting scientists. And that you would even have in China. In China, there was no such thing as competition with neighboring countries. So that's very interesting that, <clears throat> that this paradigm uh, already has a lot to say about what the takeoff uh, 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 took place so recently and in Europe and not elsewhere, okay? Uh, a second uh, enigma is secular stagnation. Uh, 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 very interestingly, if you look at the average rate of, the, of TFP growth, but I could also look labor productivity growth, uh, after a boost, uh, uh, that's in the US, huh? so it's an average yearly rate of TFP growth. Uh, you see after a boost in the US between 95, 2005, there's been a, a strong decline of TFP growth, even though you have the IT and uh, the uh, information technology and, uh, and artificial intelligence revolution. So how come, despite those revolutions, which have the potential to boost growth incredibly, uh, 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 how, how come you have uh, stagnation? And so we discussed that in chapter six of the book. And the most plausible explanation, and what's very interesting is that this uh, uh, boost followed by decline of productivity growth is mostly happening in IT producing sectors, which is the black curve, and IT using sector, which is the gray curve. It has to do with IT. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, and what's very interesting also is that this up and down of growth is very much mirrored by a rise and decline of entry rates. So the, what happened, and we think the most plausible explanation is that the IT revolution allowed the emergence of large firms, we call them the GAFAM in France, you know, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Walmart, uh, you know, uh, Apple. And those firms first, when they spread, uh, they could spread the range of their activity very much. Quick. And in, by first, it led to a boost in productivity growth. That's, that's the boost that you see, you know, uh, between 95, 2005. But then those firms, uh, you know, became tentacular uh, they, through merger and acquisition, they uh, invaded most sectors of the economy and they discouraged entry and innovation elsewhere. That's why you have this decline in entry rate of new firms uh, as of the early 2000s. <clears throat> and in fact, the problem, and we discussed that in chapter six, that competition policy was not well adapted uh, uh, to uh, the digital era. Those firms could essentially do merger and acquisition as they, as they wanted without uh, facing any limit. Uh, because, you know, never one would uh, tell us that, you know, you can't do this merger because that will damage uh, future entry and future innovation in the sector. <clears throat> so there is a need to rethink competition policy. But you see the difference between Schumpeter or Gordon on the one hand and us is that Gordon, or Schup uh, Gordon would be pessimistic. He thinks, well, you know, secular stagnation, is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fact. We can do, not do anything against it. Uh, um, Whereas our view uh, is to say, no, if you reform competition policy, maybe there is a chance to uh, revert things and to, uh, uh, and to uh, put an end to the secular stagnation. You see, so that's, uh, that's where we are, the Gramscian optimist by opposition of, uh, you know, uh, pure pessimism of Schumpeter or Gordon. Another enigma is the middle income trap, which we discuss in chapter seven of the book, there, for example, you know, Korea is a country that grows very fast between 1945 and the late 80s, and then growth slows down in Korea. Uh, uh, Japan is not a middle income, but it has a bit the same syndrome. Japan grows very fast between uh, 1945 and the late 80s, and then uh, slows down. And uh, what we explain in chapter uh, seven of the book is that, you know, during those, uh, the, that growth was very much due to catching up. It was a countries catching up with more advanced technologies. Because you have two ways that you can induce productivity growth, generate productivity growth. One is by imitating advanced technologies. One is by innovating upon yourself. When you are uh, far below the technological frontier, the main source of productivity growth is 
imitation and catching up. When you are already close to the technological frontier, the main source of productivity growth is that you innovate at the frontier. But the institutions that are good for catching up are not the same institutions as, as those that are good for innovating at the frontier. Okay, that's very much based on work I did with uh, Asimoglu and Ziliboti. In, and, uh, uh, and in fact, what happened is that, you know, during the catching up phase in Korea, some conglomerates emerged. They called them chowballs. These conglomerates, not only they discourage entry in their sectors, but they also, you know, put pressure on governments not to move uh, from institutions that were good for catching up to institutions that were good for innovating at the frontier. And in particular, what we explained in chapter four and chapter seven of the book is that competition policy. Competition is very important to stimulate innovation at the frontier. Because at the frontier, you, uh, you, you innovate to, to escape competition with your, your rivals. Okay? When you are there uh, innovating upon your immediate rivals, competition, more competition induces you to innovate more uh, in order to escape from your rivals. Uh, when you are in the business of catching up, uh, not having much competition is not a big deal. Uh, you can survive without competition. But when you are in the business of frontier innovation, competition is very important. And, <clears throat> and what happened in Korea is that those conglomerates that emerged, uh, you know, during the catching up phase, they not only they prevented entry of new firms in their sectors, but they also discouraged governments, you know, they put pressure on governments not to increase competition. That was true also in Japan, where the big, they called that the Keritsus, the conglomerates in Japan. The Keritsus, would be forces that would uh, somehow go against competition. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, and so that's, uh, that's the thing. And so it's interesting that you can avert the phenomenon of the income trap if you manage to limit the power of these big conglomerates, okay? And uh, that's what happened in Korea when they had the financial crisis of the late 90s. It weakened the power of the troubles. And then not only it allowed for more entry, but it, it also made it possible for the Korean government to implement more pro-competition policy. And, so, and that, that made growth resume in, in, in Korea. So that's very interesting how the good can come from the bad. The bad was the crisis. The crisis weakened the power of the conglomerates and that allowed, that unleashed some uh, energy that, uh, you know, that boosted competition and, and, and frontier innovation. <clears throat> uh, uh, sources and dynamics of inequality. So uh, uh, the, that we deal with in chapter five and 10 of the book mainly. Uh, uh, we know that, you know, there's been the work by Piketty, Saez, Atkinson, explaining that the share of income of the top 1% income earners or the share of income of the top 0.1% income earners, uh, percent income earners uh, uh, has gone up a lot uh, 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 since the 1980s. That's a fact. Now, should we bother about that? And uh, in fact, you see what's very interesting is that we look, innovation has a lot to do with it. If you look in the US, for example, the places where the share of income of the top 1% income earners has increased the most are typically innovative places like California, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York. So innovation is certainly part of it. And we wanted to, to look at that in detail. And so that's very much based on work I did with Axigit, Bergeau, Blondel, Emus. <clears throat> but the chapter five of the book is very much about that. And what we show is that uh, we use a, a cross US state panel data. And we show that whenever in a US state, you have more innovation intensity, which you move more to the right, you also have a higher share of income of the top 1%. That's the continuous line, you see? So, and why is that? Is because when you get, you innovate, you get innovation rights. So no wonder that, you know, innovation uh, pushes, uh, uh, you know, top income inequality. Mr. Skype became rich because he invented Skype. Mr. Bill Gates became rich because he invented Microsoft. Mr. Steve Jobs became rich because he created Apple. You see, innovation is a source of top income inequality. But you see, what's very interesting is that you can look also at the effect of innovation intensity on more global measures of inequality, like the Gini. Gini is a measure how, of how globally you depart from perfect equality. When the Gini is zero, everybody earns the same. When the Gini is one, is that if, uh, almost everybody earns nothing and uh, only the very top, top earners earn everything. <clears throat> That's when the Gini is equal to one. And what you see is that there is no effect of innovation intensity on the Gini. So how come 
uh, innovation boosts uh, uh, top income inequality, but not the, the more global measure of inequality like the Gini. The reason is that innovation boosts social mobility. If you had to draw a, a line there, the line would be clearly increasing. That's based on cross uh, commuting zone data in the US and same paper, the same paper <coughs> in the review of economic studies. And, uh, uh, and why is because very much is creative destruction. Creative destruction means that you have new innovators replacing uh, old technologies, incumbent firms. That's a source of social mobility. New people climb the social scale because of they innovate. And in fact, we show that it's mostly entrant innovation, which is positively associated with uh, uh, social mobility. So that's very interesting. You see, innovation is a source of top income inequality. But it's a good source. Why? Because innovation generates growth. We saw that before. Innovations uh, generate social mobility. And, and because innovation, on the one hand, increase top income inequality, but also generate social mobility, overall, innovation has no effect on global inequality. So innovation is an OK source of top income, of, of top income inequality. By contrast, with uh, uh, lobbying and barrier to entry, entry barriers and lobbying, uh, they uh, uh, increase top income inequality because they secure rents at the very top of the income distribution. Uh, but they reduce social mobility because lobbying, what it does is that it prevents entry of new innovators. Uh, because it prevents entry of new innovators, lobbying reduces growth, but it also reduces social mobility. And because it reduces social mobility together with increasing top income inequality, lobbying increases the Gini, glo increases global inequality. So in instead of in in innovation intensity, I was putting lobbying here. I would have that both the continuous curve and the dotted curve would be apart sloping, you see. And there, uh, if I were putting lobbying and mobility, instead of having an increasing, I would have a decreasing, you see. So what I say is that you should not treat Steve Jobs and Carlos Slim the same way. <clears throat> Steve Jobs is someone who becomes rich because he innovated. Carlos Slim is someone who is very rich, I don't know, uh, because he's at the head of an unregulated uh, uh, telecom monopoly in Mexico. And that's not the same as uh, Steve Jobs. So uh, you should not treat Steve Jobs and Carlos Slim the same way. And alors, now, having said that, uh, even the innovators can use their rents exposed to prevent subsequent innovation. So uh, uh, I have to make sure that I'm not against having rich people, particularly if they become rich because they innovated. But still, I have to make sure they want to use their rents to prevent subsequent innovation. And that I do through taxation policy, but also through competition policy and through rules to organize political campaigns. For example, in the US, a firm, <clears throat> a rich entrepreneur can finance political campaigns without any limits. In Europe, fortunately, uh, we strongly regulate the financing of political campaigns, which makes the, make sure that incumbents do not bias too much the political game. You see, so that's that's what I have to say for inequality. Uh, let me wait. Uh, five, another reason why uh, innovation is good for social mobility is that innovating firms, and I, we explain that again in chapter five. Innovating firms, what they do is that they give here it's for uh, uh, unskilled workers, and I compare the wage evolution of an unskilled worker in an innovating firm, which is the, the continuous curve. And in a non-innovating firm, which is the dotted curve, first you see that at, for, at any time spent in the any tenure, and here is tenure of the worker, at any tenure level, uh, 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 um, you know how many years you spend in a firm, the innovating firms will sp will pay a non, even an unskilled worker more than a non-innovating firm. The, the continuous curve is above the dotted is above the dotted curve, but you also see that it's more upward sloping. The, you see the, the, the innovating firm uh, will give more wage promotion uh, to an unskilled worker than the uh, dotted curve. And the reason is that the uh, innovating firms have more of uh, what we call good jobs. And good jobs are jobs that enhance what we call soft skills. You know, you have the hard skills, which are the skills you acquire at school. <clears throat> but you also have soft skills like interacting with others, taking initiative, being trustworthy. Those are what we call soft skills. And in fact, uh, innovating firms have more jobs that uh, in, uh, enhance soft skills. And that's why they tend to promote more and, 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 and pay better, even on skilled workers. Give me one second because I need to get uh, candy. I need for my voice. I'm losing my voice. One second. Uh, 
Okay, so that's what. So the first thing is the is the uh, you know what the first thing is that the paradigm allows you to uh, uh, elucidate a number of enigma in the history of economic growth. The second thing we do in the book is to question commerce wisdom. The first common wisdom is that taxing robots protects employment. That's not true. Because in fact, in work with Antonin, Bunel, and Jean Ravel, we show that firms that automate, they create employment. And, uh, and they create employment because in fact, they become more productive. Because they become more productive, their export prices go down. You see what I mean? They can, they can reduce their prices. Because they reduce their prices, their sales go up. And because their sales go up, they can employ more. You see what I mean? So that's the thing is that you have a productivity effect that more than counteracts the, uh, uh, the direct effect, the, the, the substitution effect of manpower by machine. You see, when you robotize, you become more productive. Because you become more productive, you can employ more and you can, uh, you become more productive and therefore you have more demand for your product. And because you have more demand for your product, you employ more. So taxing robots would be more counterproductive because you would make it harder for, uh, it would discourage firms from automating, which would uh, prevent them from becoming more productive and therefore preventing, prevent them from uh, uh, selling more and therefore hiring more. You see, that's, uh, so that's, uh, that we, we discuss that in chapter three of the book. By the way, that may, this productivity effect may explain why uh, uh, neither, uh, um, why none of the firms, neither of the uh, technological revolution, be it the steam engine revolution in the 19th century or the electricity revolution in the 20th century, have produced the mass unemployment that some people had feared. You know, when you had the, the steam engine revolution, you had the Luddites movement, where in England, you know, there was big movement by workers who were afraid that, you know, they would lose their job due to the automatization induced by the steam engine revolution, that did not happen. And when you had the electricity revolution, Keynes was fearing mass unemployment, but it did not happen. And again, we believe because of this productivity effect. The second, uh, uh, the second thing is the idea that we want to discuss, yet we do that in chapter 13 of the book, is that protectionism is the way to regain control of value chain. And, uh, uh, and in fact, you see what's very interesting here. Uh, in 2020, when you had the start of the, of the pandemic, we looked, we compared between France and Germany in uh, looking at three products, masks, respirators, and tests. And in those products, uh, uh, the, the black curves are Germany, the gray curves are France, the triangles are exports, and the circles are imports. You see that Germany was a little bit better than France uh, on these products in 2002. But then Germany has improved a lot on these products uh, uh, recently. And not only that, but the, uh, uh, Germany has a net surplus of 20 billion euros in those products, whereas France has no surplus at all. And, and, and Germany achieved that by innovating, by investing and innovating, not by waging trade wars, okay, by increasing tariffs, none of that. And in fact, what's interesting is that you can see here uh, uh, the link uh, uh, that tells you that in pharmaceutical products and medical technologies, if I look at the distance, the dotted line is the technological frontier in terms of flow of triadic patents. Triadic patent is a patent which is registered in the US patent office, European patent office, and Japanese patent office. You can see that in 95, France is very close to the technological frontier in terms of flow of triadic patents. But France has deteriorated a lot since then, and hence the, the decline of France in terms of the world share uh, of trade uh, in those products worldwide. You see what I mean? And, and the, so innovation is the best way. In fact, we explain in chapter 13, and we show that if you wage trade wars, uh, the destination countries will retaliate by closing export markets. If they close export markets, uh, that will uh, 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 that will reduce your own incentive to innovate because you will have smaller rents for your innovation. And therefore, you will uh, decline more because you will have less incentive to innovate. And therefore, you will lose 
uh, in terms of world market share, you see? And so uh, uh, protectionist policy is a very short-sighted policy because in fact, you shoot yourself in the feet because in fact, there will be retaliation. You will use export market that will reduce your incentive to innovate. And because it reduces your incentive to innovate, you will lose to uh, other places in the, uh, on the world market. A third uh, a common wisdom we criticize is that negative growth is the way to stop climate change. Although it's true that in a sense, you know, if you look at temperature, temperature has stopped, started to grow exactly at the time of the industrial takeoff. This curve is almost identical to the takeoff curve that I showed you at the beginning. And that's the counterfactual. That's with the industrial revolution. That's without the industrial revolution. And you can see that also for China and India, for example, China and India, the growth takes off in the early 2000s, and that's exactly where the temperature, the CO2 emissions go up. So in that sense, you could say, well, you know, let's go back to pre-1820. <clears throat> but that, I think, would be a mistake because, uh, uh, you know, we gained a lot with prosperity. That's how we live so well. We can, uh, that's where you have the progress, health, fantastic progress in healthcare, in, uh, you know, in hygiene. Uh, in uh, standard of living, without the growth, we would not have that. And uh, we don't want to go back to pre-1820. Uh, uh, in fact, you know, we had an experience of negative growth. It was the first lockdown. Uh, I'm sure Italy was like France. You know, you remember the first lockdown between March and May, June 2020. For example, in France, uh, GDP went down by 35%, but... Uh, 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 CO2 emissions went down by 8%. And, uh, uh, and, and, and the thing is that if we wanted you know, to, uh, to fight climate change, we would have to maintain permanently our countries in the first lockdown. But I don't know in Italy, but in France, the first, we had no choice. But the first lockdown resulted in you know, uh, violence with, in, in families. Uh, uh, it resulted in, uh, you know, in, in, in psychological problems particular among the, young, the youth, you know, among the young generations. Uh, we don't want to remain permanently in, in a first lockdown. So I think the alternative is then is green innovation. So green innovation means innovation to find new sources of energy, which are cleaner innovations to find, you know, ways to save on energy uh, consumption. Uh, it's also innovation on our ways, on our habits, on our ways of living, on uh, but innovation is really the, the way out. And we analyze that in chapter nine of the book. And uh, uh, what, we we what we explain there is that firms that used to innovate in dirty technologies in the past, they continue to innovate in dirty technologies in the future because you tend to continue doing what you are good at. We call that past dependence. So that implies first that creative destruction would help us because new firms, <clears throat> by definition, do not face a past dependence problem because they didn't exist yesterday. So they did not take bad habits because they were not there. So creative destruction is a way to fight climate change already. But of course, there is another way is that the state has a role to play to redirect technical change. The state can do that through carbon tax, but also through subsidies to green innovation and through industrial policy by investing itself, you know, in nuclear energy or in other energies uh, uh, that are cleaner. Uh, and uh, we explain that how that's done, uh, um, and um, and and also the civil society has a role to play. We explain in the chapter nine that you know uh, the name and shame works very well uh, when, when wherever consumers uh, uh, you know uh, are very concerned about the environment, firms uh, uh, you know have to follow what the consumers want, particularly. Uh, in more competitive environment where firms uh, face competition with rivals, because if I don't do it, Claudio will do it, and I will lose consumers to Claudio, uh, and I don't want that. So uh, the, 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 the combination between consumers' concern for the environment and competition, product market competition, is a very strong uh, driver of uh, green innovation. So you see there are many drivers uh, that you know the state, and, and you can see the triangle, firms innovate, but the state can redirect uh, technical change, but so can the civil society starting with consumers. And that we analyze that in chapter, uh, in chapter uh, uh, nine of the book. 
Uh, and then I come now to the last part of the, the last thing that the book does is to uh, is that the is the rethink future of capitalism. The framework, the Schumpeterian paradigm, is uh, provide guidelines to rethink the future of capitalism. So, uh, in fact, uh, 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 the COVID has uh, acted as a revelator. Uh, first, uh, uh, it has shown that you know the broken social model in the U.S., but it has also shown that the innovation ecosystem in Europe is not adequate. So let me say a bit more there. If you look uh, here, I compare the black curves are Germany and the gray curves are the US. The triangles are unemployment rates and the circles are the fraction of population without health insurance. In the US, when you lose employment, you, are, you have a probability, positive probability of losing also health coverage. And so in, in, during the COVID crisis, unemployment rates went up in the US and so did the probability of the, the fraction of, people, of population without health coverage. Whereas in Germany, everybody uh, got health coverage. And if I put Italy instead of Germany, you would have Italy exactly like Germany, you see? But US, they were not able to ensure the most vulnerable citizen against the COVID crisis because the most vulnerable lost health insurance precisely at the time where they needed health insurance. <clears throat> I can look similarly at the fraction of population who move into poverty. When you lose employment in the US, you have a probability of falling into poverty. And the circle gray is the, the, the shows you that you know the fraction of US population falling into poverty went up with the COVID. No such thing happened in Germany, and, the, and Italy would be like Germany. So you can see socially, <clears throat> the US model is not good. It cannot properly ensure. Uh, its most vulnerable citizens, you see. But on the other hand, uh, 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 you know, when it comes to innovation and the vaccine, for in, in particular, uh, US is much better than Europe. We know that, you know, there was AstraZeneca, but apart from AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Johnson, Moderna, uh, we are all there thanks to those vaccines. And all those were financed by the US. And uh, the US has a much better ecosystem of innovation than Europe. Uh, we discuss in detail the ecosystem of innovation in chapter 12 of the book. Uh, uh, we start with basic research, very important to have freedom and openness in basic research. So those are best done in labs and universities, but you need well-funded universities. And in the US, universities are well-funded because of tuitions, but also because they have, uh, uh, you know, they resort either on state aid, help, aid. I mean, for example, California has public universities but also they have public institutions like the National Science Foundation. Uh, in biotech, they have also the National Institute of Health. They also have private uh, foundations like the Howard Hughes Medical Investigator, Investigator, which is a private foundation that finances uh, good researchers on the long term so that they can take uh, risky projects, they can undertake risky projects. And all, all that is, all this ecosystem is only for basic research. So you have universities well-funded, NSF, NIH, HHMI, uh, all those guys, basic research only. And, uh, but then also in the US, when you want to move from basic research to applications, you need to have startups. And uh, they have much more developed venture capital and business angels uh, and private equity to finance startups. But also when you grow bigger and you become a listed firm, you still need support to innovating activities and the institutional investors, pension funds, mutual funds, they are play a big role. And you see that through all the stages of the innovation process in the US, they have much better institutions to finance research than we do in Europe. And they have the DARPA and the BARDA. So the DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, which was created in the 1950s when the US were racing with the Soviet Union in space and defense. Uh, it, it, that's, uh, those type of institutions are there to turn a basic technology, a basic knowledge into uh, 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 industrial applications within one or two years or three years. And uh, so the, the, it's, it's for activities where you have a clear mission, put a man in space, uh, produce this kind of weaponry, uh, 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 you know, uh, produce this kind of vaccine, okay? So the, the money, uh, the funding comes from the government. That's the top-down part. 
that the government names some team leaders for a period of three to five years, the, and the team leaders have full uh, latitude uh, to uh, elicit competing projects and uh, public-private partnerships, and that's the bottom-up part. So it's really a very smart way to do industrial policy, which combines the top-down part, the money comes from the top, and uh, they name the team leaders, and the bottom-up, the team leaders elicit competing projects. So it was first in the domain, in the field of defense and space with the DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. The subsequently, we generated the GPS, internet, uh, uh, autonomous navigation, all those guys come directly or directly from the DARPA. <clears throat> subsequently, the US created the equivalent for energy called ARPA Energy, ARPA-E, and then they created the BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, which generated the vaccines. Uh, you had the, uh, the RNA messenger technology, and you had to turn it into production, mass production of vaccine within a year. And that's what the US managed to do. They invested $12 billion into doing this last year. At the same time, Europe invested $4 billion, but not in this DARPA type of governance. So you see all the fantastic ecosystem that the US has for innovation. We have nothing of the kind in Europe. So <clears throat> US is better than Europe uh, uh, for innovating, and Europe is better than, uh, uh, than the US uh, uh, when it comes to social protection and inclusion. So the, the capitalism we want is a capitalism that would combine the good side of the American model, innovation, with the good side of the European model, protection and inclusion. Some people believe that it, uh, having a more innovative capitalism means that it has to be less protective and inclusive. And when you want to have a more protective and inclusive capitalism, it has to be less innovating. And I don't believe in that. I think there are three types of policies, at least, that would make you both more innovating and more protective and inclusive. So one is flex security on the labor market. One is education. And one is competition. So let me talk about them, uh, each of those three. Flex security. In chapter 11 of the book, we explained that in the US, when you lose your job, you lose status, you lose uh, access to health, bad things happen to you. And there is this phenomenon that Anne Case and Angus Deaton have coined as death of despair. Uh, they look at middle age, uh, white non-Hispanics unskilled, and they show that the mortality of the, those have gone up sharply since the 2000s. And they link it to the fact that when you lose employment, you lose status, you lose, uh, uh, you know, health insurance, partly uh, the family uh, decomposes, uh, you go through lots of stress. And as a result, you know, you go into sleeping pills, antidepressants, opioids, uh, uh, obesity, because you eat a uh, lot of bad, you know, unhealthy food. And that, all that contributes to, uh, you know, rising uh, mortality rates. Well, you don't have anything of the kind in Europe. Uh, by contrast, in Denmark, and that we also again talk about that in chapter 11 of the book, Alexandra Roulet shows she compares the health of uh, a, a worker whose uh, uh, place of employment uh, 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 closes down uh, with an identical worker in age, education, experience, but uh, a place of employment doesn't close down. So it's a deep and deep. And uh, uh, they sh uh, she shows that there is no effect. Uh, 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 you know, there is a, the difference between the worker in the firm that closes down and the worker of the, the identical worker in, in a firm that does not close down. Uh, no, uh, no effect uh, uh, of the and at time zero. That's where the the plant closes down. You see that uh, there were not different before. There are no different after. So. Uh, so no effects overall of becoming unemployed on the annual probability to purchase antidepressants, anti-anxiety, or sleeping pills. Similarly, no effect on the probability of visiting hospital for circulatory uh, disease, and no effect on mortality either. Why? Because in Denmark, they, found flex, they created the flex security system. When you lose your job for up to three years, you get 90% of your salary up to uh, $600 a, a week. Huh? Uh, 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 you get so you get good salary, so you can maintain your family, etc. Of course, you keep your health insurance intact, uh, uh, 
and uh, number two, the state retrains you and helps you find a new job. Uh, and if you are you are proposed more than two, uh, several jobs in your qualification, if you refuse more than two jobs, you lose uh, your insurance. But you see, overall, it works very well because this flex security system uh, makes creative destruction work much better. But at the same time, uh, it uh, 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 it makes creative destruction work much better. But at the same time, uh, it also uh, 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 you know uh, increase protection. So it, you see this uh, Danish system boosted innovation in Denmark and at the same time uh, uh, made protection much more effective. So you can be more in innovative and more protective if you introduce this flex security system like they have in Denmark. The second, uh, 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 you know, the second uh, instrument uh, uh, that can uh, make you both more innovative and more inclusive is education. In chapter 10 of the book, we look uh, at the probability of inventing as a function of parental income. And parental income uh, is on the left, is on the horizontal axis, and probability of inventing is on the vertical axis. And you see that uh, the left hand side curve is the US on recent data, uh, based on work by Bell, Shetty, Jaravel, Petkoval, Van Rinan. The middle curve is the uh, historic is the US historical data from Axigi, Grigsby, Nicolas, the paper I was mentioning before, and the right hand side is Finland. But you see, you have similar J curve. Uh, uh, when you have uh, parents who uh, earn a high income, uh, you are much more likely to innovate. Alors, that, that's, uh, that's interesting. Alors, why also in Finland, where education is free and high quality? So that's an enigma for us. But that uh, we, we now, uh, in fact, you know, we try to decipher the, the enigma to to uh, to um, unveil the enigma, to resolve the enigma. And in fact, what you can see in, in Finland is when you control for, for parental education, you see the curve becomes the red curve. So in fact, the reason why having higher income parents in Finland makes you more likely to innovate is because high income parents are also more educated parents. And more educated parents, they transmit knowledge and aspirations to their children, aspiration to innovate. And that's what you get when you have uh, parents who are more educated. Uh, uh, it's true that you could say, well, but if the school is so good in Finland, how come the, you don't learn everything you need at school? But the problem is that the schooling, uh, school is very good in Finland only since the 1970s. It became really inclusive since the 1970s. Uh, if you restrict attention to children who went to schools after uh, 1970, their parental income doesn't matter much. It will have a much flatter curve. But it, it turns out that most of the inventors in Finland went through themselves through the schooling system prior to the 1970 reform. And that's why you still have the J curve. But if we maintain for several generations in a row, this uh, very inclusive education system, high quality and, 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 and very uh, you know, accessible to all in Finland, for several generations, uh, the prediction is that the curve will flatten. And, uh, uh, and why is it important, the education? Because in fact, in our societies, we suffer from a phenomenon of lost Einstein. You have smart children who are born to uh, parents, to families which uh, don't have the education and the aspiration that they can transmit to their children. And as a result, you have many, what we call lost Einstein. If you have now an education system like the Finnish education system for several generations, what you will have is that you will have much less lost Einstein. So it will make your economy much more innovative, but at the same time more inclusive, because we know that particularly innovation by entrance is what is a booster of social mobility. I discussed that when I discussed inequality and innovation. Innovation, particularly by entrance, so boosts uh, uh, social mobility. So if you have a, a more inclusive education system, you will have more innovation because less lost time, less lost Einstein, but at the same time more social mobility. <clears throat> the last one is competition. I told you about, you know, uh, I told you about, you know, the secular stagnation, and I told you that, you know, the decline in CFP growth came from, you know, uh, very likely, you know, associated with uh, uh, the, you know, these big conglomerates, these big firms, the big uh, that, you know, became big with the IT revolution, and then they became, you know, they, they in, in a sense, discouraged entry by other non-superstar firms. Right? So uh, uh, 
Now, uh, if, you, if you implement a more competitive policy or more effective competition policy in the US, uh, in particular, a competition policy where you, do, you regulate merger and acquisition by superstar firms, uh, uh, then what you will do is that you will boost innovation because you will have more entry of new in, in, innovating firms. But at the same time, uh, uh, you will also uh, boost social mobility once again. Uh, because we know that entrant innovation boosts social mobility. So if you have a, a competition policy, like competition policy will make you both more innovative and more inclusive. At the end of the day, let's go back to the Schumpeter pessimism. Schumpeter was pessimistic because he thought that the first innovators would turn into entrenched conglomerates that would successfully uh, prevent subsequent innovation. Uh, there, one thing is that the state can do something because the state can impose competition policy uh, uh, and, and, and make sure that entry continues of new firms. Uh, uh, but the problem is that the state can be captured by incumbent firms. And we saw that in particular when we discussed, uh, uh, you know, middle income trap. So uh, what do you do then? Although you could say, well, the judiciary power could do something. Uh, we, the judiciary could control the executive power. And we discussed that in chapter 15 of the book. Uh, but the problem is that, you know, the constitution is an incomplete contract. You could have a constitution that specifies separation of power à la Montesquieu, and still uh, this remains purely formal because uh, how can you enforce the constitution? And that's where the, the civil society, <clears throat> the last, uh, you know, uh, corner of the uh, of the triangle matters so much because the society will be there to make sure that the separation of power will be enforced and that the collusion between uh, the uh, executive power and the incumbent firms will be uh, limited and that's why you need the triangle firms state and civil society that's uh, so Sam Bowles and Wendy Carlin talk about this triangle but what we show here is that it's very much at the heart of the Schumpeterian debate. Schumpeter was pessimistic because he, he, he overlooked the fact that you could have this triangle that could indeed uh, help uh, avert the pessimistic pre prediction whereby you know, the first innovators turn into entrenched incumbents, which successfully uh, prevent new innovations, you see. Uh, in civil society indeed plays a crucial role as a means of ensuring the effective implementation of the constitutional contract. I mean, just to give you an example of the importance of civil society, uh, uh, you know, US, they had the civil war in the US, you know, in the 19th century, which was won by the North. As a result, uh, slavery was abolished and they introduced the 15th amendment in the constitution, in the American constitution, which would make it possible for the African-Americans to vote. But the problem is that the Southern states in the US uh, circumvented this amendment through literacy tests, which de facto would prevent uh, uh, the African Americans from voting. And it took the whole civil rights movement and uh, uh, to finally uh, have uh, the Supreme Court enact the voting rights, the voting act, which would preclude the literacy test and uh, allow Make, uh, make it really possible for the African Americans to vote. But between the Civil War and the, the, the you know, and the, the Voting Act, uh, one century had to come. And, and, and it took one century and, and a big fight, the civil rights movement. And uh, that's where it really illustrates that without the civil society, you know, uh, the constitutional contract can become void. In fact, is in, is in operant, is ineffective. You know, Colombia, as the same constitution as France. But if you are a union leader in Colombia, you are very likely to be assassinated. Not the case in, in, uh, you know, in France or in Italy, because we have a very strong civil rights movement. So uh, uh, that's the outline of the book. Uh, we lay out the paradigm. We contrast the Schopenhauerian paradigm and the solo model in particular. And we uh, talk about how we measure concretely creative destruction. The takeoff uh, uh, enigma is dealt with in chapter two. In chapter three, we discuss the technological waves and in particular, why it's a bad idea to tax robots. Uh, in chapter four, we talk about competition. We should explain in particular why you know, competition is an engine of, of innovation uh, at the frontier when you innovate at the frontier. 
Uh, then we talk about the inequality and innovation, chapter five, secular stagnation, chapter six, middle income trap, chapter seven. Here we talk about the structural change from agriculture to industry to services. Mm -hmm. Then we talk about green innovation, chapter nine. Then that's where we talk about, uh, uh, you know, the fact that parental income, uh, the effect it has on, on probability of inventing. Uh, that, that's we, we talk about that. And we talk about basic versus applied research. Why the basic research, which involves freedom and openness, is best done in universities, and the more applied research, which involves focus, uh, more focus and proprietary, is best done in firms. Then we talk about the, the health and happiness and creative destruction, and that's where we talk particularly about you know the social model. There we talk about the ecosystem of innovation, financing creative destruction. Then we talk about the globalization and the protectionism, and there we talk about the emergence of investor state and insurer state, the role of wars and crises to make the state not just be law and order, but the state as an investor in education and innovation, and the state of, as an insurer of firms and households against uh, the business cycle. And then we talk about this triangle between firm, state, and civil society. And so that's the outline of the book. So I think I would stop, stop there. Thank you very much. <clears throat>